Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm Dr. Giancarlo Marra from the University of uh, Turin uh, in Italy, and I'm chief editor of the Uronco platform. We are here today in uh, Sevilla, Spain, for the Uronco 25 Urological event. And today we have the pleasure to have with us Professor Prokar Dasgupta, who's a world-known uh, urologist. Uh, he is from King's College London, where I also had the pleasure to work for one year. Now, a, a bit of time has passed, but I still remember very, very well and very happily this, uh, this uh, time. Professor Dasgupta is going to give a lecture on artificial intelligence and prostate cancer. Uh, again, hot topic, uh, uh, very important, but it's also something uh, that needs to, to get to, to practice. We need to know how artificial intelligence can can help us. And when we discuss, when we talk about prostate cancer, I think we can identify two main areas, which is the diagnosis of prostate cancer and also the, the treatment as prostate cancer treating physicians. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, um, AI can help us in terms of imaging, but also in terms of pathological examination. What about imaging? How do you think uh, im uh, AI can, can help us in, in, in this part. Giancarlo, uh, as you know, now the standard imaging, if we are suspecting prostate cancer, is a multi-parametric MRI. Some people are doing biparametric, uh, not using the contrast, but MRI of a high quality standard of care. So here is an image, and AI, of course, has the opportunity and the power to do what is called pattern recognition. So there are a number of papers already out there, one very recent, uh, looking at whether we can tell, firstly, is there a cancer or not? And second, is there a significant cancer or not? So an example from King's would be something called autoprostate. Autoprostate can take an MRI, segment the entire gland, find the clinically significant lesions, and then produce a report which augments that of the radiologist, does not replace the radiologist, augments that of the radiologist by reducing the variation in reporting. So I think that is of considerable value in the radiological diagnosis of prostate cancer. Yeah, I think this, this is a, a very important point to highlight. So the, the, at the moment, the goal of the AI is not to replace us, it's not to replace physicians, but is to complement and help physicians losing less time and being, becoming more precise. I think on JAMA, it was recently published uh, a paper from a PKI consortium in which they showed B-parametric MRI was already very good in, in finding clinical suspicious prostate cancer, but if you add AI-assisted readings, there is an improvement both for expert and non-expert readings. So we get better and better and better through the use of, of AI. That is correct. Um, I think a similar context, a, a similar, a similar um, reasoning, a similar help uh, is the one that AI can give us in the pathological diagnosis of prostate cancer. So uh, you mentioned that there has been a very important work, the, the, the so-called PALNDA challenge in, in the pathological examination. Can you, can you explain a bit more about Correct. this? Correct. So the PALNDA challenge was actually published in Nature Medicine, a very, very high impact uh, uh, paper. And I had the honor of writing the editorial in the uh, Platinum Journal uh, for the uh, PALNDA challenge. Uh, what happened was more than 10,000 prostate biopsies were put on a public platform called Kaggle, essentially a platform where people from all over the world, in this case programmers from Europe and the United States, were able to access the platform and almost like a challenge write programs to see if they could at least match the report of a pathologist or even better it. And in 10 out of 15 occasions, that's exactly what happened. And it is important because this was across the globe. This is not just a particular lab trying to do a particular thing. So you can standardize this, multiple programmers trying to live up to this challenge. Again, we are not trying to replace our pathologists, but perhaps this takes away the more mundane tasks from the pathologist, reduces the variations in reporting, and leaves them to do the more important work, i.e. the critical cases of prostate cancer. 
Yeah, so again, even for the pathological uh, aspect of, of a diagnosis, yes. AI can help us so we can get quicker, but also better through AI with us, of course. Correct. So moving from the diagnostic to the, to the treatment paradigm of, of prostate cancer, uh, again, also in this setting, uh, we can have contouring for radiation, uh, and we can have many, many, many applications. Yes. Uh, focusing on, uh, on surgery, how is currently uh, helping us and how is potentially going to help us uh, um, artificial intelligence? We already saw some, some work, some papers coming out, for example, with AI uh, trying to predict the risk of, of bleeding. Yes. This was during a radical prostatectomy, so we know Luckily, the risk of bleeding is not enormous, but still very interesting, although I think it needs some more, uh, some more develop, development. Are you, uh, have you any insights on, on, on current artificial intelligence application during surgery? Absolutely. Uh, look, my uh, lab, along with uh, others, uh, as part of Responsible AI UK, has been doing and championing a lot of work in this space. So there are three main uh, parts of it. One is personalizing the operation, a robotic prostatectomy in this case. Uh, second, trying to operate remotely. Uh, and third, teaching uh, those uh, next generation of surgeons with AI. So let me take the first one. Today, by surgical data science, we can segment an entire robotic procedure in real time. In fact, uh, there are tools which can send you that video, segmented video, recognizing the entire operative field and send it to you five minutes after you finished a robotic radical prostatectomy. How amazing is that? But then the question is, so what? I think what it needs to do and is able to do today is to give the surgeon no-go areas. Don't go here. You might cause more incontinence. Don't go here. You might cause a damage to the neurovascular bundle. We have just completed a very important uh, study called the Touch and Image Guided Robotic Surgery uh, Study, or TIGERS is the uh, short form of this. TIGERS had three arms, just turning up and operate uh, based on an MRI. Second, generate a 3D image from the MRI using AI. This is called InnerSight. InnerSight uh, is a company which has come out of King's and purchased uh, by Carl Storr. So the images are beautiful, not just for kidneys, but also for the prostate. And the third is using Mona AI label, uh, which comes from NVIDIA. And we have a partnership between the London Institute for Healthcare Engineering and NVIDIA. They are in our labs. So we use Mona AI label to almost automatically segment the prostate and the significant cancers, the nerve bundles, and the sphincter. So all the important structures. And I have, in the morning, a 3D printed prostate personalized to the patient in my hand, and I can design my operation around it. The results have just come out, uh, the preliminary ones in the BJUI, but watch this space. I think you'll find that this can personalize surgery. Francesco Porpilia, as you know, in Turin, uses a metaverse to see if he can find the prostatic artery early, clip it, and reduce bleeding, thus making the bundle dissection for erectile function uh, much better. Now, the other space is telesurgery. So if I was to operate from here to 10,000 kilometers away, then I would need to shorten the distance, fool my brain to think the distance is only 10 milliseconds. So we can use 5G, and then we can use AI to shorten and shrink it that distance. Sense. And today, we have compatible uh, robots, which we didn't uh, for 20 years, which can do this uh, with a lag time of less than 130 milliseconds, for example, and at a fraction of the cost. I'm told only 50 euros. I mean, can't get cheaper than that. But then finally is the gestures that a surgeon makes. Uh, this really was pioneered by Andrew Hung, and now we have a collaborative piece of work between San Rafael and King's showing that there are certain gestures that a surgeon makes during robotic surgery which improves the outcomes for patients, such as incontinence and erectile function. And I think that is a very important piece of work which allows us to teach robotic surgery better to the next generation of aspiring robotic surgeons. Okay, so very, very exciting, very interesting. I think um, at the moment we use a lot of 3D models for kidneys to see where the cancer is, to see where the pedicle is and how to clip. Okay. For radical prostatectomies, 
currently it may be a bit more complicated because it's, it's different to overlap, but still I think is, is key. It's key for the apex because we already know before the, le the urethral length on, on MRI can predict continence. So maybe we can have models predicting this, and if we yes. decide to operate the patient, we exactly know where we can cut without the risk of getting apical cancer. Yes. When we do bundle dissection, we can exactly see real time where the cancer is. So yes. I think this will, will help a lot. Of course, we will need data on that, but yes. it, it's exciting. We, we will be able to do it in the, in the, in the yes. next years, actually. Absolutely. And to, to conclude, I think a very, very straight question. If, if I would tell you, how do you see an OR in 10, 15, 20 years? How would you describe the next generation OR AI-based, I think? I see a OR, Giancarlo, with sensors. So not just uh, looking at the video, but the voice, the sense of touch. We have so much data that we gather during a particular operation that we just throw away. So I think a more integrated OR with sensors that can help the surgeons, the anesthetists, the patients ultimately, and the entire scheduling team. That's how I see things. Now, uh, the press, of course, uh, think that everything will be automated completely. Some parts can be automated. For example, suturing. We had a major grant uh, from UK Research and Innovation called Trustworthy Autonomous Systems. The levels of autonomy in this kind of surgery go from zero to five. Zero being uh, no autonomy, five being machine does everything. Now today, the most autonomous system that we have is the Procept biorobotic system, which is level three, where you mark the prostate out with an ultrasound and a water jet does the rest. But to think that very complex procedures will become completely automated, level four and five, and be trusted by the public I don't think that will happen because you know what? Each of us is slightly different, slightly different. And I do not think that today there is a large language model or a machine learning tool which can look at those fine differences for individual patients. Uh, so while I do not want to predict this, I do not think in the next 10 years we will have completely trustworthy autonomous systems, at least uh, in my operating room, uh, in robotic surgery. Hey, listen, I've been wrong before, so uh, I stand corrected, but that, I think, is my prediction. So this is very interesting. I think it's also reassuring that we will still have a role, you know, in your opinion, in, uh, in 10 years. Isn't it why we are, we are physicians, the fact that everyone is different, so we get something new every day? Sometimes it's a negative thing, but most of the time it's a positive thing so that yeah. makes, makes surgery more exciting. So thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, uh, it was a very interesting discussion. We will see maybe in 10 years if we will redo the interview and the discussion how the OR is in 10 years and maybe predict the other one 10 years <laughs> later. But thank you very much for being uh, with us today. It was a real pleasure and uh, we are looking forward to, to future developments uh, of AI in uh, prostate cancer. Thank you. Giancarlo, a pleasure to be with you in Seville. Thank you so much. Thank you.